So, uh, but before that, let me talk about black holes and about how we actually get to see black holes. Um, and Ansi made already a really nice introduction where black holes and neutron stars come from, namely from uh, explosions of giant stars in supernova. But let me just give you a little bit of a feeling how small those things actually are. So what you see on the image is our sun. It's the big orange ball. And down here, the little small black dot is our Earth, just to give you an impression of the size. So what you do if you want to turn our sun into a black hole is squeeze it down. And something that's, well, 1.5 times as heavy as our sun gets squeezed down to something like that big. Compare that to Manhattan. So it's kind of, well, Amsterdam size, something like this. So really, really small. Or another good comparison is if you take our whole Earth and squeeze it down, the way down to a small marble. This is the size of a black hole that has the same mass that our Earth has. So we are talking about something that's extremely small, and well, black tells you already it's dark. So where are all those black holes? So if we look at kind of the vicinity of our sun, so this is our sun there in the middle, and the closest star to us is Alpha Centauri, it's about four light years away, and there are a few other smaller stars that we can't easily see by eye somewhere in there. And if we look, kind of think about our galaxy and how many giant stars have been there, how many of them have had to have exploded as black holes and neutron stars through the history of our universe, we come up with an idea that, well, there should be a black hole about every four light years, so about as far away from us as Alpha Centauri. Um, can we see it? Is there really one? We have no idea, because the problem is um, very small, very dark objects. Imagine trying to see like a small, tiny end of a pin in black somewhere in New York from here. Um, searching for a black hole is even more complicated than that. So the problem is we simply don't see most of them. So why am I talking about seeing black holes? Because what we do can see is actual material that falls into a black hole. So if a black hole sits there being all quiet, no way that we can recognize that it's there ever. But if something falls into it, we can. And the way it works is, um, in some supernova explosions, some stars come in pairs as binary stars. And if one of the stars explodes as a supernova and becomes a neutron star or a black hole, now OK is a black hole, the other stars can just keep sitting in there. So this is our normal star, the big blue thing over there. And close to it is a tiny black black hole. And some of the material from the star falls onto a black hole. And no black holes don't suck. They don't actually kind of push the stuff into that. It's the material that really by itself flows in. And as it falls in and forms what we call an accretion disk. It's a little bit like the water that drains down into the top, kind of a similar uh, behavior. And some material from close from the black hole can get ejected again in jets. Really important thing about the jets is they don't come out of the black hole itself. Nothing can escape a black hole. So it's really something really close to the black hole and out there. So uh, why X-rays? Uh, well, well, first of all, let me show you a small video of how it actually looks like. So we are kind of closing in onto the black hole through the accretion disk and looking onto the black hole in the middle. So this is an accretion disk, and cl from close to the black hole, the jets comes out. Um, and this is a slide that Liz has, in a way, already shown to you. So the visible light that we do see is just like one part of radiation that um, that's being that exists there in the universe in a very small one. There's some much more energetic radiation, namely X-rays and gamma rays. And gamma rays have been per first observed by um, Röntgen in 1895. So it's Röntgenstrahlung if you happen to be German like me. So this is kind of the typical X-ray of your hand in that case of uh, Wilhelm Röntgen's hand. Now, if you look at kind of like each of us here, we all actually emit some infrared radiation, just warmth that happens in here. So this is a photo of me and my friends in, um, in Chicago, Fields Museum in that case, and you kind of can see that my friend Natalie has really cold hands and our old glasses are really super cold compared to our skin. Uh, the same thing is, well, if you 
take iron and just heat it up at some point it starts glowing because white glowing so you kind of get from infrared for something that's like as warm as my skin to a much brighter light uh, in case of iron and if you now make the things even hotter and hotter and hotter at some point you move into the UV and into the x-rays and in the case of the black hole if you look really close to the black hole then up there we are at the 10 million degrees so it's like incredibly hot for our own sun is about 6,000 degrees hot so the emission that comes out of here from really close to the black hole is actually emission is actually x-ray emission this is why we have to observe that in x-rays uh, if we have to observe that in x-rays there's a problem x-rays don't actually reach all the way down to the earth this is pretty good because well I don't want to be kind of like at an x-ray machine all the time that's kind of really not good for my health and what you can see on the plot it kind of it shows you how far different kind of radiation reaches so a uh, radio goes all the way to Earth, infrared gets stopped in the atmosphere, visible light obviously reaches us, uh, UV, X-ray and gamma rays don't reach us. If you think about how far an X-ray uh, an X-ray particle, an X-ray photon can travel in the atmosphere, then for about 30 keV, this is a certain measure uh, of energy, it's a few meters, it's the X-rays that are used uh, by your dentist, for example. X-rays at about uh, 3 keV, this is the ones that are most interesting for astronomers, travel 10 centimeters in Earth's atmosphere, so there's no way we can observe them down here, so the only way is to go out to space and this is why European Space Agency this is why I'm working for them so this is all the different instruments that we have and if you are lucky enough to win one of the mouse pads uh, you'll see kind of this nice picture on there and there are two of those uh, satellites out there are actually X-ray satellites namely XMM Newton and Integral so However, it's not quite that simple to observe X-rays. If you take your normal mirror, the way a normal mirror with light works, a normal mirror is, it's like a bouncy ball. It's like, like a ball. So you throw a ball against the wall, and it jumps back. So this is pretty much kind of the light from this like nice old gentleman falls onto the mirror and then gets bounced off. This is why we. This is how the mirror effect works. Uh, now imagine instead of a ball you get something that has a lot more energy in that case kind of like a bullet or a cannonball um, this is not going to jump off the wall it's just going to slam into the wall all with all the power so this is the problem that we have with x-rays because they are much more energetic so it's just like slam into the mirror and go through them so this is not the, we can't build a normal mirrors for x-rays but if you think about bullets if a bullet goes against the wall on a really small angle, it can ricochet off the wall, right? Kind of instead of going into the wall, it's going to jump on a certain angle. And this is the very thing that we are using in x-rays. So instead of building x-rays where the light just, instead of building mirrors, not building x-rays, where the light just comes directly down, what we do is we make those x-rays ah, come in and like ricochet on a really small angle of the walls of the mirror. So X-ray mirrors, so this is example from Chandra, and in reality, this is what an X-ray mirror looks like, not like a mirror at all. So those are kind of multiple shells nestled into, into each other, and on, on each of the one, uh, X-rays are ricocheting off. And this is really impressive, so you kind of see the size of this whole thing. The outer shell is just 0.5 uh, millimeter thick. The, well, the inner shell is 0.5 millimeter thick, the outer shell is just one millimeter thick. And this whole thing is exact down to nanometers, and then you put this thing onto a rocket. Shake it really, really well to get it into space. Um, and it still works. And it still is like perfectly aligned. It's like amazing engineering work. So, uh, what we can see with a, a mirror like that, uh, the wonderful images that you've seen before, however, those all haven't been quite details of what happens close to the black hole. We still can't resolve, like, we can't see a disk or, like, really close, jets as far as they're really close by. What we can see is in the back, an art, oops, in the back you see, an, again, an artist impression of an, of an black hole accreting from a companion. And what you see in the small inset is 
on the x-axis, so kind of the horizontal direction, you see the energy of the individual photons. And on the y-axis, kind of up and down, you see how many photons arrive. And you see the kind of like strange patterns in there. And by looking into the details of this pattern, what we can say, because while well, we are clever astronomers who have studied that for a while, that some of the material actually doesn't fall from into the black hole but gets blown away. And this you can see on the background image, so kind of some part of the just getting out again. So this is one thing we can observe and one way we can see X-rays. Uh, there's a different way. So if your bullets just slam into the walls, um, in your, into your mirrors, how about not using mirrors at all? There's another way to actually make images that we sometimes forget about because it's, well, in a way far too simple, and that's by throwing shadows. And the most simple example of if you go, well, if you stay here for another hour or another two hours and then go back home and go past multiple street lights you'll see multiple shadows right kind of because you have m many different light sources so you have many different shadows and then from looking onto the shadow pattern you can calculate back where the light actually is and this is in a way you can also see on that image so you have three different colorful lights throwing three different colorful shadows. And this is something we can use out in space too. So the idea is we have several different black holes or different di several, several different sources on up there in the sky. And we build something that throws sort of shadow and then we measure the shadows down there. And then we calculate back what the things on the sky look like. And the thing that shows shadows is called a mask. And it's a pretty complicated technical thing. Uh, because, well, you have to like really be able to calculate back. So what the code, those coded masks look like, these are some examples from different instruments. And three of them, Gemix, Ibis, and SPI, are all on the integral instrument. So those are the things that throw shadows from some black holes on the sky. So the images that integral makes look something like that. So you kind of see that it's a pretty messy image because you can imagine, well, shadows are not the most exact thing, but it's the only way to actually look at sources like this at very high energies. And the one cool source here is actually at Cygnus X1. And I talked to someone about my, um, um, ah, yeah, necklace, thank you. I forgot the English word before. This is actually signals on there because I worked on that source uh, uh, during my PhD, so I got this from friends. So this is a black hole, and so this is a source like this really making this radiation. And what we can also we can do, we can not only look at the radiation, but we can again look at properties of radiation that are slightly more complicated. And in that case, we are looking at whether they are polarized or ordered. And you don't have to understand the plot. The idea is we pretty much look at whether the individual photons march all in step or the slightly or slightly out of step. And if they all march in step, that tells you that the things are really polarized and that it all they come from a really, really small area to know about each other and to be able to work in step. So we can tell that this emission really comes from the few kilometers from close to the black hole. And from that, we can tell something about what happens close to the black hole. And well, this is how we observe black holes through X-ray eyes. And well, um, thank you, and it's been great being here. Thank <laughs> you.